Holy Father, every time I hear that song, just reminded just how truly good you are. Many of us come from families where perhaps our father was not so good. But God, you are perfect in all your ways. And God, I know that I am loved by you. And that love was without, is without question because it was proven when you sent your son to die in our place upon the cross. And we know that Christ's death was sufficient because he rose from the dead three days later. He is exalted to your right hand, and one day he will come again. We're thankful for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who not only empowers us to live the victorious Christian life, but also has sealed us in Christ until the day of redemption. Thank you for the blessed hope of Christ's return. Thank you for so sweet a salvation. Thank you for the assurance of our eternal security. And I pray this morning, Holy Father, that we would worship you and that we would give our minds to you. And I pray that our ears would listen, our hearts would be receptive, and that we would re receive the word of God as the word of God and not as the word of man. R remind us once again, Holy Father, it's not about how much of the Bible we know. It's about do we obey the Bible? Do we obey what we know? Lord, our obedience is the proof of the love that we have for you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want to ask if you would to go ahead and open your Bibles this morning to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8. As we'll continue on with our series, we've got about two, two or three more sermons in this series. Um, the, the series is entitled, Expect Great Things from God, Attempt Great Things for God. So, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And you know that, uh, as I've already shared with you, that that quote comes from William Carey, the father of the modern day mission movement, who spent his life in India for the cause of Christ and his legacy continues to go on as people are continuing to be reached as re in India as a result of his gospel witness. He was a man who truly did just that. His life was exemplified by those two things. He was a young man who expected great things from God and he was also a young man who attempted great things for God. And I don't know about you, but I, I realize that our time here on earth is limited. It's limited. And I want to spend my days here on earth doing just that. Expecting great things from God while attempting great things for God. I want my life to mean something. And when I die, I don't want people to talk about how great I was. I want people to talk about how great Jesus is. And so, may I live my life in that way. And by the way, that's the way I'm seeking to lead this church. Is that we would be a church that is passionate about the gospel. That we would be a church that walks by faith and not by sight. And that we would be people of the book, right? And that we would expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Look there at Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to read verse 1 through 8. Now, that's not all the sermon. We're going to look at the whole chapter, all right? But just to get us started, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. So let's look. It says, All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard. And on the first day of the seventh month, and he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattitiah, Shema, Ananiah, 
Uriah, Hilkiah, Masiah on his right hand, and Pedadiah, Mishael, Melchijah, Hashem, Hasbroniah, Zechariah, and Meshalem, all on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. Lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads, and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Benai, Sherubiah, Jamin, Akuba, Shabutiah, Hodiah, Masiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hannah, Peliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law. And while the people remained in their place, they read from the book of the law clearly, and they gave sense so the people could understand what was being read. Well, as I was thinking about how to introduce this sermon, the, by the way, the title of the subtitle for this morning's message is Joy Inexpressible. And you'll see where that comes from here in just a moment. Joy Inexpressible. I can remember years ago, I used to like to ride bikes. I don't do that anymore, but I used to like to ride bikes. Mo bicycles, not motorcycles. And when I lived in Inola, there was a lot of flat land there, so it was easier to ride a bike than it, here, than, than it is here in Edmond especially where I live, out in the far northeast part of Edmond, where there's a lot of hills. So, I've given up bike riding, but I can remember when I first started riding a bike. I'm not talking about a little kid, but really getting serious about it, where you buy the special kind, and you wear the special shoes, and you wear the special shorts, and you wear the special hat, and the gloves, and man, I, I was going to get all into it. And I bought this bike, and got on the road, and I started riding this bike, and I noticed that it was hard. It was really, I mean, it seemed like the, the, the farther I went, the harder it got. And then this went on for about a week. And finally I realized, I said, it can't be this hard. When, I mean, let me, let me check the air in the tires. And, and I felt the tire, and I wasn't a professional. I mean, I, was, I didn't know much about bike riding. I thought if it was too tight, then when I put my body on there, it would just, the tire, in my mind, the tire was going to explode if it was too tight. And so I started asking people who were bike riders, I said, how tight should the air be in the tire? They said, man, you should not be able to push that in with your thumb. Well, I could push mine in pretty good ways with a thumb. Now, when I bought it from the store, it wasn't that way, but it had lost air. And it didn't lose air because I let the tire out, but just over time of riding it, it began to lose air. And as a result of losing air, it became harder to ride the bike. Now, that may be a poor illustration, but I believe that's, that's where many Christians are today. I mean, you started out in your walk with the Lord on fire. You could say, boy, your, the tube in your tire was aired up. But now your life is a little bit more deflated. I'm not saying that the Christian life is easy. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. But when you look at your walk, if you were to be honest, you would say that your Christian life right now looks a little deflated. You know why that is? It could be it's because you're not spending time in the Word of God. I'm going to tell you something. If I wanted the air in those tires to be solid, I had to put air in them. And if I want my life before Christ to be solid, I'm talking about living a solid life, a faithful life, a victorious life, then I've got to make sure that I'm putting the Word of God in me on a daily basis. You know what I started doing when I started riding that bike? I started checking the air every day and made sure that it had plenty of air in the tires before I started out on a 30-mile ride or anything like that. But you know what? Even more important than that is that I spend time in the Word of God. How many of you would want to sit under the teaching of a deflated pastor? I wouldn't. And I hope I don't ever, I may be a little deflated this morning, but it's not because I haven't spent time in the Word, right? But, but here's my point. Nobody wants, to send a, nobody wants to sit under a deflated pastor. Nobody wants to sit under a deflated Sunday school teacher. 
And I promise you, your life is going to be deflated. You're going to be easily, easily uh, prone to sin. You're going to lose joy. All those things are going to characterize your life if you are not in the Word of God on a daily basis. Some of you have lost your joy. And the reason you've lost your joy is because you've compromised at some area in your life. You've, you've compromised, or perhaps there's a sin that you haven't truly gotten rid of. Or maybe you're trying to live for the Lord, but you're trying to live for the Lord in your own strength, in your own power. And if the truth will be known, everything comes back to what you do with the Word of God. What are you doing with the Word of God? What place does the Bible have in your life on a daily basis? Now, let's just be honest. I believe that there are some people here this morning, and I have no doubt that, that you're saved, but here's the deal. I bet there are some saved people here this morning, and I bet there are days that go by in your life where you're not in the Bible. I believe there are weeks that go by in your life where you're not in the Bible as you should be. And God forbid that you would allow months to go by where you're not in the Bible as you should be. I'm going to tell you something. It's, it's hard to expect great things from God and attempt great things for God if you're not in the Word of God. It, it's hard to live a life of, of joy that's inexpressible if you're not in the Word of God. Well, when we come to Nehemiah chapter 8, that's exactly what we see. Now, you'll remember that the walls have already been rebuilt. The gates have been hung. So the physical part of restoring Jerusalem, the physical part has already taken place. But now Nehemiah invites Ezra to come in, Ezra the priest, to hold a Bible conference, if you will. You see, because now that the physical things are set in place, it's time to make sure that the spiritual things are set in place. And we're going to see in this passage of Scripture that when they begin to restore the people back to God, how do they start? They start by giving the Bible its place of, of superiority. They don't worship the Bible, but they understand that the Word of God must be in a very high place. Now, some people, when you preach about the Bible like this, they'll say, well, you're, t you're preaching Bible worship. No, not, not, I don't worship the Bible. I, I don't worship the Bible. I worship Jesus. I worship God the Father. I worship the Spirit of the Lord. But make no mistake about it, this is God's voice. This is God's Word. And the Word of God have a, ought to have a place of primacy in our life as it did for Ezra and Nehemiah. As a matter of fact, if you look at your Bibles, go back to verse 1. It says, all the people gathered as one. And I want you to notice something here. Notice who initiates this. It's not the leaders who initiate it. It's the people. Look. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And look. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the, law, that the Lord had commanded Israel. Who was it who, start, who wanted the book? <laughs> it was the people. The people said to the leaders, the people said to Ezra, bring the book. We want the book. We see the book's place of, uh, of priority concerning the people of God. If you want to keep notes today, that, that's my first point. They wanted the book. They wanted the book. I'm afraid that we live in a day where people don't want the book anymore. Where the preaching of the Word of God no longer has priority. Do you understand, and I'm not calling any of them out by name, but do you understand that there are churches today where you can go and you can sit in that church and not hear the book? Sometimes it's used as a platform or a starting point. The Bible's open. The pastor or the speaker, whoever it is, will read from the book and then set it aside never to go back to it. That's what we're not, that, we're not called to that. I, I, I'm glad you brought these young men here, Brock, today, who feel called to the ministry. Above and before everything else, we're called to be preachers of the book. What that means is that when I stand up here, in, and by the way, this is where we get pulpit preaching from is in this chapter. Notice that Ezra what did they do? They built a wooden platform that was above the people. It's not to exalt the preacher. What is it to exalt? It's to exalt the Word of God. 
right? The preacher is just a messenger of, of the Word of God. And I have a responsibility to preach sermons that are driven by the Scripture. What that means is that from the beginning of the sermon to the end of the sermon ought to be Bible-saturated and driven from the text. We need churches today that are filled with people who want the book. Now, I love this church. I, there's many things I love about this church. One of the things I love about this church is that this church is easy to preach to. You love preachers, and you love preaching. You want the book. You come here on Sunday mornings because you want the book. And people who join this church, they know that if they join this church, they're going to get the book. And so I'm assuming that they're joining because they want the book. But, but here's my question. How are you wanting the book outside of the church? In, in, at home, in your daily life, are you wanting the book? Does it have a place of priority in your home, fathers? Does it have a place of priority in your life, mothers? Teenagers, does it have a place of priority in your life? If you're only reading it every other day or once a week, listen, that is not a place of priority. Priority means just that. It's a priority. And, and I want to encourage you, this is not meant to shame us or guilt us in any way. But my responsibility as a pastor is to help us to walk in the center of the will of God. And let's just be honest, you cannot walk in the center of God's will if you're not in his book. Now, the Bible tells us that in the last days, and by the way, we're in those last days, that people will not want the book. Let, let, me, share you, let me share a passage with you, 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is what the Bible tells us about the latter days, okay? Listen, which we are already in. 2 Timothy chapter 3, listen to this. Are you ready? Verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, Lover of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unpleasable, slanderous, with, uh, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. The Bible says, avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into the households and capture weak women. Burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. So these men also oppose the truth. These are, these are many of your television preachers that you see on TV. They do what they do in order to prey upon widows. Hey, send me all your money and God will bless you with ten times more and there is, this, there is this false preaching that is taking place. There is this health, wealth, and prosperity movement that is absolutely against the Word of God. And television is full of preachers who just use the pulpit as a platform to speak their own philosophy. Now listen, I'm a fallen man just like you are. You understand that? God's placed a call on my life. But the last thing that you should want is to come to church and hear the preacher talk about his ideas for 30 minutes. Or in my case, about 45 to an hour, right? That, that, should be, that should be the last thing that you want to hear. You shouldn't want to wake up, come to church, and, want, and, and the preacher read from the Bible and then spend 45 minutes never getting back to it. Is that what we need? Is that what we should want? No, we should long and desire for men to step in the pulpit and who start with the Word of God, stay with the Word of God, and finish with the Word of God. But the Bible says that there are going to be days, in the last days, the days that we live in, where people aren't going to want that. They're going to want preachers to tickle their ears and to give in to their own fleshly desires. He says, verse 10, You, however, have followed my teachings, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. 
which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord, uh, the Lord rescued me from them all. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Listen, if you don't live according to the words, you won't be. <laughs> you won't be persecuted if you live like the world. Preachers won't be persecuted if they don't preach the Bible, but I promise you this. If you start living for the Word and you start preaching the Word, I promise you, persecution will come. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Bad, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how from your childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And then he says to the preacher in chapter 4, verse 1 of 2 Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. I don't know about you, but I want the word. And when I sit down and I go to a Bible conference and I'm sitting out there and I'm listening to a preacher, I show up and I come to that Bible conference because I want the word. And so I'm praying that he brings the word. Do you want the word? You know, listen, we can gripe and we can moan about the moral decline of our nation. We can gripe and we can moan about presidential candidates and all that. But what we need today, I'm telling you, listen, we say we need a conservative this or we need a evangelical that. But listen, you know what we need? We need people in the pews who want the word. Amen. That's what we need. That's what we see in Nehemiah, don't we? I mean, spiritual restoration is occurring. And it all started with what? People who wanted the word. And so we look there and they asked for the word. And then we go back to Nehemiah. And the Bible says that in verse 3, And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. I don't know if we can hang in there like that today, do you? But from early morning until midday, he preached the word. In the presence of men and women and those who could understand. Now look at, look at the last part of verse 3. And the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. You see, not only did they want the word, you know what they did? They listened to the word. You know there's a big difference between saying you want something and then actually listening to something? When, when the word of God was being preached, the people, what, what did they do? They listened. I was reading a couple of days ago in one of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's books, his classic work, Life Together, and this is a quote from Bonhoeffer. The love of God begins with listening to his word. The love of God begins by listening to to his word. You see, when you want the word and you listen to the word, your love for God grows because you realize how much he loves you. And we see here in this passage of scripture that the people who came together, they were from outside of Jerusalem and they were from inside Jerusalem. But they all came together with one common desire. What was that common desire? They wanted the word and they wanted to listen to the word. This is something I try to teach my children on a regular basis. I'm not as faithful to it as I should be, and neither are they. But we sit around the kitchen table, and we have our Bible devotion time. And one of them is reading from the Scripture. And just like most kids, some of them want to grab on this one and pick at that one and make goo-goo faces at that one. And you know how it is. But, but I'm trying to teach them, listen, when the Word of God is being read, we need to listen. And we need to pay attention. And I'm saying the same thing to you here today. How often... Do you come to church and truly listen to the Word of God? Some of you may make grocery lists. Some of you may be playing on your iPhone, drawing pictures, making mustaches on the preacher in the, in the bulletin. <laughs> but listen, we should listen to the Word of God. I mean, this is his word. What did the Second Timothy passage tell us? In the Greek it says, all scripture is theopneustos. You know what that means? The breath of God. 
All scripture is the breath of God. And then he goes on to say, 2 Timothy chapter 3, around verse 16, it's not only the very breath of God, it's what? It's profitable for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. This is not, this, this is not a book like any other. This book was written by over 40 different authors over a 1,500-year period. The authors ranged from doctors to kings to shepherds. And the book, from beginning to end, even though it was written by over, over, over 1,500 years, by 40 different authors, it tells one unfolding story. The redemptive plan of God. You can't say that about any other book. You know why you can't say it? It's because no other book is the Word of God, the breath of God, but the Bible. So not only should we want the book, we should listen to the book. Why? Because it is, it is a guard against wickedness. The Bible is, the book is. The Bible says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to what? A keeping it according to the Word of God. I have treasured your word in my heart, the psalmist says, so that I might not sin against God. It's a guide to the wise, the book is, the Bible is. The scripture says it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's a crushing hammer for those who have a hard heart. Jeremiah said, it's not, it's not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters rock, that is the word. It's a life-giving force for the spiritually dead. Ezekiel said, so I prophesied. In other words, I spoke the word, and as I, and as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, rattling. And the bones came together, bone and bone, and they did what? They received flesh. The, 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 the valley of dry bones came to life at the speaking of God's word. You see, the word of God, the book, the book, brings life. The psalmist said in Psalms 119, verse 25, My life is down in the dust. Give me life through your word. It's a source of joy for the joyless. In Psalms 119, verse 47, For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. Where do you find your delight? Where do you find your joy? In the commandments of God, in the book. It's an enduring word. The Bible says in Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withered. And the flower fadeth, but the word of our God stands forever. It's a source of strength for the weak. Psalms 119, I am weary from my grief. Strengthen me through your word. You want strength, spiritual strength? You want to get it? Get in the word. It's a source of hope for the hopeless, the Bible says. Remember your word to your servant. You've given me hope through it. The, the psalmist said, Lord, you've given me hope through your word. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is an offensive weapon and a defensive weapon against the onslaught of the satanic host. It's a piercing instrument for the spiritual surgeon. For the Word of God, the Bible says, is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intention of the heart. Charles Spurgeon said, nobody ever outgrows scripture. The book widens and deepens with our years. Oh, how we need the book. We should want the book. We should listen to the book. And we should expect to hear from God when the word of God is preached. So I want to encourage you, by listening to the Bible, it's going to take discipline. You've got to discipline yourself to listen to the Word of God. Do you also know by listening to the Bible, it's going to prepare you to follow God? And not only is it going to prepare you to follow God, it also reflects your relationship with God. If you don't want the Bible, and listen, if you're not reading it, you're not wanting it. If you don't want the Bible and you're not listening to the Bible, that says a lot about your relationship to God. What if I said to you, uh, I don't want my wife and I don't listen to her. Would you tell me I had a healthy marriage? Would you? You would say, no, you need counseling, wouldn't you? But so often we treat God that way, don't we? 
We don't want his book and we don't listen to God. And by the way, if you're not in the book, you're not listening to the Lord. I have people say to me all the time, I pray all the time, Pastor. Well, that's great. I'm, great. I'm glad you pray all the time. But if all you do is pray, it's a one-sided conversation. You're doing all the talking and none of the what? The listening. Because if you want to listen to God, you've got to be in the Word of God because this is the very breath of God. So not only did they want the book and not only did they listen to the book, they respected the book. They respected the book. If you'll look there at your Bibles, when Ezra stood up on the wooden platform, and let's go ahead and move down to verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood, and Ezra blessed the Lord, and the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads, and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, I've been in many churches where pastors will say, please stand in the honor of the reading of the Word of God. You ever heard, you ever been in a church like that? You know, that comes from here. It comes from this passage. But I want you to notice something. Ezra did not ask them to stand, did he? Huh? It was a natural response to the Word of God. It was a natural response to the respect the people had for the Word of God. Now, I don't believe that this is prescriptive. Pre something that is prescriptive in the Bible means this is what God is telling you to do. This is what you do. I believe that this is descriptive. God is simply describing for us what took place on that day. And when the Bible was read, the people stood, they raised their hands, they said amen and amen, and they bowed their faces to the ground, and they worshiped God. Here's what I'm saying, is that when we come into this place, there ought to be a clear demonstration of respect for the Word of God. One of the ways we demonstrate that as Baptists is that we do preach from a raised pulpit. And, and the pulpit is always in the center. Some churches have it over to the side. We as Baptists, we always have the pulpit in the center. That, 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 this is very symbolic. It's raised because we, it's emphasizing the authority of preaching. But it's also in the center because we realize that preaching the Word of God ought to be the center of what the church is about, right? So this is not just about rearranging the furniture. This is truly symbolic. And so when the pastor stands to preach, there ought to be respect shown. shown. And the way we do that is by listening to the Word. But we also demonstrate respect. We also demonstrate respect by submitting to the Word. Notice that they bowed their heads and they worshiped. That was their way of submitting to the Word of God. They were saying, God, this is your Word. We realize that when that Bible is preached, you are speaking. And so, Lord, we bow in submission to the Word of God. It also says that they're teachable. We're going to go on and read here in just a moment. Matter of fact, if you look there in verse 9. It says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat, fat, uh, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing, for this day is holy to the Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So he says to them, this is a day for you to be happy. This is a day for you to celebrate. But what happened? When the word of God was read, the people became convicted of their life of disobedience, right? Their life became, they became convicted. And as a result of conviction, they began to weep and they began to mourn over their sin. And that's what the Bible does. The Bible is like a mirror. It shows us where we have rebelled and where we have sinned against God. And that's why we need the word of God. That's why we ought to respect the Word of God. That's why we ought, to, when we come into a church, we ought to expect to hear God's voice. And when the Word of God is preached in its proper context, then you can be assured that you're hearing from God. And so, the, Nehemiah said, don't mourn, or the, the leader said, don't mourn, don't weep. This is not the time for that. This is to be a day of celebration. And what's neat is this all took place on the seventh month, which was like New Year's Day uh, for the Jews. You see, the, day, the, 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 week, the Holy Week would 
start off with the Feast of Trumpets, where the trumpets would be blown, signifying to everyone that the, the holy time, the, 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 the events of the Holy Week, and also that whole month, there would be uh, the Day of Atonement, there would be, and there would be the Feast of Booze. So when the leader said to them, don't, don't grieve, don't mourn, why? Because in 10 days, we're going to celebrate the Day of Atonement. Now, you don't get that from this text, but you get it from Leviticus, okay? We're going to celebrate the Day of Atonement. And what would take place on the Day of Atonement? Once a year, the high priest would take a spotless lamb into the Holy of Holies. And he would sacrifice that lamb there in the Holy of Holies on behalf of all the people, on behalf of the nation for their sin. And then there would be what's called the scapegoat. And the high priest would pray over the head of the scapegoat. And the scapegoat would be let loose into the wilderness. One lamb was slaughtered, signifying that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And the other goat that was let loose in the wilderness signified that you're, now your sin is separated as far as the east is from the west. So the leaders were saying to the people, don't grieve and don't mourn. For in ten days, we're going to celebrate the Day of Atonement. And your, ten, your sins will be atoned for. You will be forgiven. You will be cleansed. And what does the Day of Atonement point to? Who does it point to? It points to Jesus. Jesus is the true sacrifice. And when we read the Word of God, it will convict us of sin. But we're not to mourn and grieve as those who have no hope. Because if we are saved, we've been forgiven. And our sins have been paid for through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're also going to see... Not only, not only did they want the word, and not only did they listen to the word, and not only did they respect the word, but we're also going to see that they obeyed the word. Now, before I talk about that, I want to share with you a personal story. On one of my many mission trips to India, we were ha hosting a Bible study for house church pa uh, pastors there in India. And these Indian pastors would come from all over the region. Many of them would ride bicycles for miles. Many of them would walk for miles. Many of them, it took days just to get there. Some of them had to ride the train, and it's, you know, where everybody's piled on top, and because it's too full, and the people, run, they ride on the front of the train. You've seen pictures. But they would spend days to get there to sit in a Bible conference that, my, that myself and some other pastors were leading. They were taking time away from their normal jobs. They were taking time away from their families. And they were sacrificing what little finances they had just to be there. And when we, when we would arrive on that first morning, they would be so eager to hear the word of God. Why did they come from so far? Why did they spend days traveling? Why did they make so many sacrifices? Because, listen, they wanted the word of God. And we would start that morning, and we would go all the way through that night, and we would do it for a solid week. And they would sleep in those schools where we, where we were teaching day after day. They would sleep there. And on the last day, they would ride their bikes or walk or have whatever they had to do to get back home. But listen, not only did they want the Word, they listened to the Word. And they respected the Word. There were times when we'd be reading from the Word of God and those Indian pastors, many of them persecuted for their faith, would just have, just have their hands and their, their face in their hands just like this. And these were men who obeyed the Word. One house church pastor in particular went to his village. He was converted, started preaching the gospel. The people in his village told him he needed to recant, deny his faith, return back to, he was a, a Muslim and they said, you need to deny Christianity, come back to Islam. And he wouldn't. So they said, you are nothing more than a dog to us. And they chained him up in the village, in the middle of the village, with a chain around his neck. And fed him from bowls. Treated him like a dog for months. And finally, when they saw he would not recant and he would not deny his faith, they finally let him go. And now he is a pastor, a house church pastor in that village. And I could share with you many more stories just, just like this. But you understand, if we're going to see a revolution, if we're, going to see a true, if we're going to see true revival, if we're going to see true spiritual awakening, if we're, going to see, if we're going to see Christians truly experience victory in their daily life, if we're truly going to be able to attempt great things for God, then we've got to be people who want the book, listen to the book, respect the book, 
and obey the book. Why is obedience important? Well, let me just give you a quote from Bill Clinton. <laughs> Bill Clinton says this, The Bible is the authoritative word of God, and it contains all truth. Direct quote. Listen, you can believe that all day long, but if you don't obey it, it doesn't mean, a, it doesn't mean anything. And there are a lot of people who believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God and it contains all truth, but they don't obey it. And in the eyes of God, it's not about how much you know or what you believe. It's about what you do in light of what you know. In this chapter, the conclusion of this chapter, they finally realize after studying the book that they had not been keeping the Feast of the Booths. What was the purpose of the Feast of the Booths? It was to remind them of how God brought them out of Egypt, how God redeemed them out of Egypt during the Exodus. And they had not been doing that. And you can see that there in verses 13 through the rest of the chapter. That they obeyed the book by observing the tabernacle, the Feast of the Tabernacles, or other words known as the Feast of the Booths. Do you believe? I'm telling you folks. And I want, and I want, to, I want to highlight a verse here for you. So look at the last part of that chapter, chapter 8. Look there on verse, at verse 13. The second day, the head of the fathers, the house, houses of all the people, with the priests and the Levites, came together to Ezra, the scribe, in order to study the word of God, or the word of the law. And they found written in the law that the Lord had commanded Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. And they, who should, and they should proclaim it and publish it in all the towns in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle palm, and other leafy trees to the, make booze as it is written. So the people went out and they brought them and made booze for themselves, each on his own roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and the square at the gate of Ephraim. Look at verse 17. And all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booze and lived in booze for, uh, for from the days of Jeshua to, uh, in the, the son of Nun to that day, the people of Israel had done so, and there was great, very great rejoicing. And that's where the title of this message comes from, Joy Inexpressible. The Bible says there was very great rejoicing. Why was there very great rejoicing? Listen, remember, they had gone through opposition. They had been opposed by Samballot and Tobiah. Nehemiah's own life had been threatened. His own character But in the midst of all that, they had very great rejoicing. In other words, they had joy that's truly inexpressible with words. What caused these people to have so much joy in the midst of so much hardship? It's because they were people of prayer. And they were people who wanted the word, listened to the word, respected the word. And obeyed the word. And I promise you this. If you'll commit to being a person of prayer. And a person of the book. You'll find that your life. Will be characterized. By joy. Inexpressible. I conclude with this poem. That I found in. Our poem. My wife tells me I have said poem. She's right. It's poem. In southeastern Oklahoma, where I'm from, it's poem, okay? But here it's poem. This poem was found in W.A. Criswell, the, the great pastor of First Baptist Dallas for many years, before he went on to be with the Lord. He wrote a book entitled, Why I Preach the Bible as Literally True. And this poem was found in that book. Let me read it to you. Though the cover is worn, and though the pages are torn, and though places bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is the book worn and old that can shatter and scatter my tears when I prayerfully look in the precious old book. Many pleasures and treasures I see, 
many tokens of love from the Father above, who is nearest and dearest to me. This old book is my guide. It is a friend by my side. It will lighten and brighten my way. And each promise I find soothes and gladdens my mind as I read it and heed it today. I want to ask if you would to pray with me. Dear church family, God has given us a great vision for our church. And I pray that we would be people who heed the book. People who obey the book. I've made that commitment myself and I pray that you'll make it with me. But I'll say this, there's one greater than Nehemiah who has come. And his name is Jesus. And the Bible says that he is the very word of God. He is the very manifest presence of all God's truth. And the Bible tells us that those who trust in Jesus Christ will be saved. The fact of the matter is this, is that there are some here today who have never truly trusted in Jesus. You've never truly repented of your sin and placed your faith in Christ. You, you have really never said no to living your life for yourself and have said yes to living your life for Jesus. You know all the facts in your head. Perhaps you've even gone through the motions. You've joined a church. You've even been baptized. But yet you've never truly surrendered your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You must embrace the gospel to be saved. You must believe that Jesus is God's one and only Son who came from heaven to earth in, in human flesh, lived a perfect life and obeyed the law of God perfectly, who went to the cross and died in your place and mine, bearing the penalty of our sin, who was buried and rose again on the third day. And if you have truly, listen, if you have truly embraced Christ as your Lord and Savior, it will be reflected in how you treat this book. Jesus said, or the Word of God says in 1 John, if you say that you love me, but yet you don't obey what I command, you're a liar. If you say you love him, but you don't obey what he commands, you're a liar. That's 1 John. Have you been living a lie? You don't have to anymore. Here in a moment, I'm going to ask for everyone to stand. And for those of you who need to be saved, there'll be pastors standing out down front. Would you walk up to one of these pastors and say, I'm coming to give my life to Christ. I'm coming to be saved. Others of you here this morning, you just want to come and, and you just want to pray, God, help me to be a father of the book. Help me to be a man of God who wants the book, who listens to the book, who respects the book, and obeys the book. Maybe you just want to come, and men, just kneel down here and pray. Maybe husband and wife, you'd like to come together and just pray that you would be the people of the book. That youth would come and say, right now, not in the future, but right now, I would be a person of the book. If you want to come and Ask for the Lord to give you the grace and the strength to be a person of the book. Maybe you've been far away from the Lord and you just want to come. Maybe you're a deflated tire. And you want to come and just kneel at the altar and say, Oh God, how I need the joy of my salvation restored. Maybe it's where some of you are this morning. Just come and ask God to restore to you the joy of your salvation. This is about the Lord. This is His time. Would you respond to Him appropriately? Heavenly Father, we surrender this moment to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you stand and begin to come as the Lord leads? You come.